Okay. So good morning, everybody. Uh, for the next 12 minutes, I'll be talking on the nuances of hypertension in the current era, focusing behind the number game. All of us know the numbers of blood pressure are very important and crucial in hypertension. And the guidelines cover the number game with great precision and perfection in terms of diagnosis, initiation of treatment, and targets for BP control. But interestingly, behind the number game, there are a panoply of facets which are important and are of great interest to a clinician. The first issue which I'm going to discuss is the mortality in a controlled hypertensive. All of us know the mortality in a controlled hypertensive is at least two times compared to a normal tensive, which means if you're a hypertensive, you control your blood pressure to the target level, still you do not come at par with a normal tensive patient. And there are a couple of reasons for this. The first thing is atherosclerosis continues awaited even in controlled hypertensive. Antihypertensive agent, which control blood pressure, no doubt decrease the hypertension related complications, cerebral hemorrhage, dissections, left ventricle failure, but they do not provide extra protection and very interesting data emerged from the HOPE3 trial. This trial included intermediate risk patients, LDL less than 130, annual event less than 1%. And you can see when uh, candesartan and hydrochlorothiazide were taken, that uh, failed to show any reduction in the cardiovascular death MI in stroke. But when only 10 milligram rosavastatin was taken, you can see on the left side of the slide, there was a statistically significant 24% reduction in the cardiovascular events. The second reason is fibrosis occurs in the different parts of the cardiovascular system. And this fibrosis can be beautifully seen by LGCMR. Fibrosis occurs in the myocardium, as you can see in the slide at the bottom, these white patchy areas. And if the left ventricle becomes hypertrophied and fibrotic, it is very bad for it. It is more prone for development of heart failure, more prone for development of arrhythmia than sudden cardiac death. In fact, all hypertrophied ventricles are being imaged by CMR. In hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we look at the scar to risk stratify these patients for ICD. Patients of aortic stenosis these days, the surgeon also look at MRI for fibrosis to see it is not there because fibrotic hypertrophic ventricle, the outcome is there. Fibrosis also occurs in the left atrium, as you can see, and it makes the left atrium more prone for development of atrial fibrillation and more prone for thromboembolic events and all uh, intelligent radio frequency ablators, they always look at the atrial, uh, atrial fibrosis because the chances of uh, sinus system being restored is remote if there's marked fibrosis in the left atrium. And fibrosis also occurs in the large vessels. This is a young compliant artery, you can see, and when the impulse from the heart traverses towards the periphery, it grows slowly, comes back slowly. By the time it comes back, diastole has already started. This results in increase in the diastolic pressure, increase in coronary fling, and therefore offers beneficial effect. On the other hand, if the arteries are fibrotic, the compliance is less, what will happen? When the impulse travels from the heart to the periphery, it goes very fast, comes back fast. And when it comes back, systole is still ongoing and it produces a panoply of adverse effect, increase in the central systolic pressure, increase in the LV afterload, increase in pulsatile strain, plaque with rupture, no diastolic augmentation, no increase coronary filling. Now, is there any solution to minimize this fibrosis? We do not have any dedicated trial. But very interesting data emerged from the long-term follow-up of the ALART trial, the conduction system disease in the ALART published in 2016. And it showed that there is a significant reduction in the conduction system disease with lisinopril compared to CTD and amlodipine, despite the fact that the blood pressure was higher in the lisinopril arm. And more trials are needed in this. 
The second issue, which is now being increasingly recognized, is increased sympathetic activity. What is its relation to hypertension? All of us know Indians are hypersympathetic, and as you can see in this slide, uh, the prevalence of sympathetic overactivity in newly diagnosed hypertension is 62%. We have also data from the BEAT survey, which showed resting heart rate is elevated in Indian hypertensives. It correlates both with systolic and diastolic pressure, and sustained elevated rate is an independent risk factor for adverse clinical outcome. An increase in heart rate by 10 beats per minute is associated with 14% increase in the cardiovascular mortality and 20% increase in the total mortality in patients with hypertension. And all of us are aware of the Indian Heart Study. It also shows increased sympathetic activity. Now, this is a very interesting analysis from the value trial. On the right side, you can see in patients where blood pressure is controlled, and if you take the quartile of the highest heart rate, there is a 50% increase in the cardiovascular events. This also applies to the uncontrolled hypertension. You can see on the uh, left side of the screen, there's a 35% increase in the cardiovascular events if heart rate is high. And there are data from several other trials. On the left lower panel, you can see in West study, as the heart rate increases, there's an increase in the old cause mortality, non fetal MI, and non fetal stroke. Data from the life study on the right upper quadrant, all cause and CV mortality was higher if your heart rate was more than 84 compared to heart rate less than. And the sister study, as the heart rate increases, you can see all cause mortality is increasing both in men and women. And there are several other publications. If you look at the FINRIS study, for each 15 beats, per minute increase in the resting heart rate, the hazard ratio for cardiovascular mortality is 1.24 in men, 1.32 in women. And all of us know sympathetic drive plays a very important role. It initiates and perpetuates hypertension, is responsible for the morning surges. It may also produce non dippers It has also adverse effects on diabetes and insulin resistance. It disturbs lipid metabolism and also increases CV morbidity and mortality and more arrhythmias and renal disease also adversely affected. And we all know in patients with resistant hypertension, we try to do renal synthetic denervation, clearly indicating uh, that it plays an important role in resistant hypertension. Now, if you block this sympathetic activity, there are a panoply of beneficial effects, homogeneous blood pressure control during the 24 hours, decrease in blood pressure variability, regression of target organ damage, improvement in the metabolic abnormality, decrease heart rate and decrease myocardial oxygen consumption, decrease coronary vascular resistance, decrease insulin resistance, and decrease LVH. But the big question is whether a therapeutic reduction in the resting heart rate by drugs in controlled hypertensives with increased resting heart rate would improve cardiovascular prognosis. This is still an unanswered question, may be answered in the future. And the second big issue is, can we offer selective beta blockers in controlled hypertensives, as I showed you? with increased resting heart rate, even in absence of CAD, heart failure, arrhythmia, despite lack of recommendations by the guidelines. The other issue which needs consideration is the target heterogeneity in hypertension. The issue is, does the target organ respond in similar fashion to lowering the blood pressure? The answer is no. If it is brain, lower systolic blood pressure is better, lower diastolic blood pressure is lower. If you remember the ACCORD study, it had two groups, 120 systolic, 140 diastolic, 140 systolic. The trial was negative, but when the strokes were individually analyzed, there was a reduction in strokes, indicating lower systolic blood pressure is better for stroke. And the inverse very beautifully showed, you lower diastolic blood pressure, there's a progressive reduction in the stroke with no j -cow. But when it comes to the question of heart, lower diastolic blood pressure is bad. Even the data from the HOT trial, if you separate non-ischemic versus ischemic, the ischemic is in brown bar. At any level of diastolic blood pressure, less than 80, 85, or less than 90, ischemia, MI are more in the ischemic group compared to the non-ischemic group. And this is the invest test study, which shows when the diastolic blood pressure is lower, there's reduction in MI. When, when it is lower, <coughs> below 70 or below 60, there's increase in MI. So there is a J curve in hypertension for coronary circulation. And in most of the studies, the J curve was found to be at the level of diastolic blood pressure 
below 80 and 70. And you can see if you bring diastolic blood pressure below 60, there's increase in the high sensitivity troponin. And patients who are revascularized, they tolerate lower diastolic pressure better. The other issue is chronic age and vascular, uh, vascular aging. Hypertension is an important premature uh, cause of premature vascular aging. And these days we can calculate the vascular imaging by simple non invasive methods. This is a patient who is a chronological age 54, his vascular age is 57, reasonable. Another patient, chronological age 37, his 37 with vascular age is 46, bad. Another is chronological age is 54, vascular age is 70, very bad. But there's no linear correlation between the number of blood pressure and the vascular aging. Other factors like dyslipidemia and diabetes also play. The treatment of hypertension is a long run of process over the years. And therefore, special emphasis should be laid on the quality of life. We must never forget life is not merely being alive, but being well. And our hypertensive patient should never, uh, should not only live, but also feel well. And we should avoid drugs with erectile dysfunction in the young hypertensive. There is no doubt that treatment of hypertension decreases morbidity and mortality. It benefits patient, but this does not decrease the number of hypertensive patients and see the number of hypertensive patients are progressively increasing in the country. So our aim should be to stop hypertension, stop hypertension and build a hypertension free India. And this is only possible in a primordial prevention. If we practice primordial prevention for several years, we will be able to decrease the burden of the disease. Prevention of emergence of risk factors in population in which they have not yet appeared by individuals in mass health education is primordial prevention. And the best target for this is the primary school children. It's been shown by studies in the United States, study by Fuster et al, that if you target these individuals, they continue to follow lifestyle modification even when they grow older. The incidence and prevalence of lifestyle diseases is markedly diminished. So we must also focus on the primordial prevention. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <clears throat> I think uh, uh, it was a good coverage of the entire topic within a short period of time. Uh, I need to congratulate Dr. B.C. Manoria. Uh, I think uh, he had highlighted the importance of resting heart rate, uh, which has an impact in not only cardiovascular morbidity, but also mortality in the long run. And he has shown a lot of studies which were conducted in our own country, particularly the BEAT study and uh, the India heart study, which had gone to prove that uh, resting heart rate is higher in our country. And not only that, it is more uh, the evening blood pressure rise, particularly the systolic blood pressure rise that's been seen to go up in people in our country. And taking these evidences into consideration, I think we need to be very careful in controlling uh, the heart rate also over and above the control, control of blood pressure. Sir, you have also mentioned that beta blockers probably will find a role in patients in whom you have a resting heart rate which is high, though the current recommendations are not uh, uh, not there. What's your comment on that? What what, what beta blocker will you be in a position to suggest? I think uh, those who have hyperenergic state, we have seen blood pressure is not controlled with other agents, but when we add beta blockers, their blood pressure is controlled, particularly the young hypertensive. So beta blockers, although they are not mentioned in the international guidelines, but we are very sure and we use them in our patients of hypertension where there is an evidence of increased uh, sympathetic activity. And within the beta blockers, what uh, would be your choice, sir? Uh, you can use nevibilol, which has many other advantages. It has a nitrous oxide effect. It doesn't produce sexual uh, uh, importance. It doesn't uh, produce diabetogenicity. The blood pressure control is better. So nevibilol is a preferred agent. You talked about the HOPE 3 study. Yes. What do you think are the most important uh, conclusive lessons from the HOPE 3 study? I think uh, the other issue is that if you look at the specimen of coarctation of aorta, these kids usually do not have risk factors for the atherosclerosis. You look at the aorta above the cord, extensive atherosclerosis, below the cord, no atherosclerosis, clearly indicating that although lipids are very important in atherosclerosis, Hypertension per se can also perpetuate atherosclerosis, perhaps or probably by damaging the endothelium, allowing the uh, process of atherosclerosis. That's why the HOPE 3 trial showed that you are an intermediate risk, you have no past cardiovascular event, your LDL is less than 30, and element is less than 1%. Still, there was a 24% reduction in the ischemic endpoint. 
blood pressure lowering drugs decrease hypertension related complications cerebral hemorrhage dissections left ventricular failure they do not benefit the atherosclerotic complication of hypertension for that the trial showed that uh, statins are useful and if you remember the ascot uh, lla trial that also showed 10 mg atorvastatin statin in the intermediate risk uh, ld uh, total cholesterol not more than 250 also there was a statistically significant reduction in the non fatal and fatal mi so statins uh, are useful in these patients even though your ldl is not very high even you any are questions intermediate. from the floor any questions from the floor dr manorya ah. can you hear me yes dr trivedi uh, uh, dr asha murthy i have just want as a, as a fantastic lecture covering all the aspects of hypertension and uh, very clear diagrammatic uh, uh, the blood flow in patient with the normal and how the patient with the hypertension occurs i have one question uh, do you have increased sympathetic activity uh, plays a important role in the development of isolated systolic hypertension especially in the young uh, group isolated systolic hypertension is an entity which we are increasing we facing and increased sympathetic activity plays an important role these patient often respond to beta blockers although the exact pathophysiology of hypertension is isolated systolic hypertension is being evaluated thank you dr manorya i think as the time is turning up only three important messages which you have conveyed number 1 primordial prevention is very vital number 2 the j shaped curve we have to keep the critical figure of 70 mm of mercury in mind and of course the last which we see quite often in our practice these days the tachycardia component in the youngsters so i believe the tachycardia resting heart rate higher is a warning sign it has to be tackled because it leads to impending cardiac problems do not manifest at a younger age so i think these are the three important messages dr manorya you have given and on that note i'll pass on to dr narsingan for the last comment i think uh, the excellent coverage of the topic we need not dwell uh, too much on that because the other speakers are ready to give their lectures